if you don't have a fire in the belly, if you don't have a passion to teach, you're not going to be a good teacher. You may be a competent teacher because based on content, but as with anything else in life, you have to really care about what you're doing. You bring that passion to the classroom, you get great results. There was an ex a study, this goes back four or five years ago, and I think it was Texas, um, on the elementary level of them bringing computerized instruction. They invested a great deal of money in computerized instruction. And it failed. Using standardized testing, the students who were in this computerized model uh, had lower achievement except for one teacher who excelled. And you think, aha, she knew better how to use technology. But when you looked at it in the standard classroom before the experiment, she excelled in the results of her students. Mm -hmm. So the modality didn't change her outcomes. Mm -hmm. It was the commitments and the style that she brought to the classroom. I don't know how you teach that or train that, but I do firmly believe having a passion for what you do affects that. Hey folks, welcome to another Resiliency Roundtable with the Northeast Resiliency Consortium. My name is Ed Fiennes. I'm a content specialist here with the NRC. And today we have Passaic County Community Colleges and the NRC's Director of Prior Learning Assessment, better known as PLA. That man's name is Harry D'Amato. Harry is, uh, has quite a unique position in, in all of our, uh, in our NRC lives. Um, we see him probably the most often in, of, uh, I mean, we certainly see Faith. Uh, our last podcast, or the most recent podcast, other than this one, but Harry's kind of he's he's part of the lead team, so we see him. Me and Alex see him quite a bit. Uh, Alex being the other voice you'll hear on this interview, Alexandra Scheindert, she is the communication specialist for us. So Harry's done it, pretty much all of it. I don't know if there's it's a pretty short list of things. It'd probably be less time to list the things that he hasn't done. Um, than what he has. Uh, aside from being a, a pro prolific mystery writer, uh, he is uh, and, and director of PLA. Uh, he has been an educator, still is an educator. I keep referring to it in the past tense, but he still does it currently rather well, teaches history. Uh, he's been an administrator of all kinds. It's really, uh, we'd be doing you a great disservice not to share the, uh, the wise and powerful Harry with you. Uh, and he'll be the first person to be incredibly self-deprecating about that, <laughs> which is what makes him so unique. He's really the the spirit of this, uh, enter this NRC enterprise. So uh, we really want to put him out into the world and, and show you, you know, and let him let him teach you something about <laughs> about what we do as educators. So without further ado, a man who needs no introduction but got a very long one, Harry D'Amato. First question, as we've been asking everybody for these resiliency roundtables, uh, I'd like you to describe as best you can um, what a resilient, in your case, college leader. I mean, you have many, you have worn many hats and you've had many titles. And uh, the current one is, was a director of PLA, director of PLA. Mm -hmm. So what, so let's say college director then, what makes a resilient college director? Adaptive skills. I think being strongly grounded in core constituencies, actually, within the, within the consortium, we talk about the constituencies, the, the constituent elements of resiliency, and we've got it right, mm -hmm. particularly with regard to critical thinking. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's that old proverb about if you give a man a fish, he eats today. You teach a man how to fish, 
needs for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Resiliency is about helping people to fish so they can take care of themselves for a lifetime. Because we know from all the literature and, and from our own experiences in the career area, very few to none of the students that we deal with are going to, the career they start with is not going to be the career they end with. So they have to be, have adaptive skills to find new jobs, new professions, ac acquire those new school skills, perhaps go back to college mm -hmm. or other training. That's all part of resiliency. It's that ability to get up, mm -hmm. keep on going. Some people today are calling it grit. I don't like the grit concept. Resilient, it's more than grit. Mm -hmm. It's about skills and ability. How adaptive do you feel like you have had to have been, maybe not even just in this particular position, but working in community colleges especially? Um, how adaptive and, I mean, I don't know, would you even say you've had to have been gritty at, at points in order to navigate a system that is can be notoriously difficult and hard to change and hard to move from one idea to the next new idea? Well, it's all a matter of perspective. I started my career at a university. Mm -hmm. And now moving from a university to a community college, that required a lot of change. Mm -hmm. I had to adapt. We are very different. In purpose, we're very different in structure. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about the ability to change, those of us in the community college sector think we're slow to change in comparison to the university or the baccalaureate environment. Mm -hmm. We're quicker than a jackrabbit. We change <laughs> rather well, quickly. But in well, my career, mm -hmm. education has changed dramatically from when I was an undergraduate to what we do today in the classroom. I would venture to guess the education we know at this moment, come 20 years from now, is not going to look like what we're doing right now. Can you put, can you put a, uh, can you name those polls in terms of what, what is, what has changed? Could you draw a, put a pin and draw a string and put another pin in now and, and kind of describe what that change really was? Yeah, we, there are two forces in my opinion, underlying in my opinion, that are driving education today. That's what we're uh, one is economic, okay. and the other force is technology, mm -hmm. and which really relates to the economics. And part of that technology part is the force pushing us is occupational. 20, 30, 40 years ago, a student going to college was thought to develop a whole range of skills, the liberal arts concept. Employment was secondary to education. It was a wonderful outcropping of education, not the purpose of education, unless you were in a vocational type track, mm -hmm. such as teacher education. Mm -hmm. Today, the pressure is for us to put people to work in meaningful ways. That shapes what we're doing. We are becoming more career-centered, more vocational-centered. The economic pressures or transformational, and one can debate good or bad. Again, I suspect the future, we will see top-tier, expensive private universities continuing face-to-face -face classroom instruction. I think the institutions that suffer, such as community colleges, the, the great difficulty in providing affordable education will be far more technological and will be hybrid so that we will be graduating people in programs that may be a combination of credit studies, of non-credit studies, stressing competencies. Mm -hmm. And we may be verifying and, you know, competencies. So I think that's happening, but I think we're right now, we're dealing with economic pressures and that need to put people to work. It sounds like you're suggesting that there's going to be a greater divide that's going to happen. I believe so. Across higher yeah. education. I know we've talked about mm -hmm. community college as a place for opportunity and often the last stop for some kind of hope and some kind of transformative change in people's lives. And so how do you think that given that kind of divide that you think is going to happen in the landscape, community colleges will continue to be really, really important factors for the economy and for 
getting people jobs and training people in these skills and competencies that, you know, we're saying are super transferable, like being able to adapt or, you know, some of the other things that fall under resiliency. Education is is vital to having an intelligent population <laughs> capable of exercising democracy. Education is necessary for a highly technical workforce that we deal with today. If we don't produce those people through our educational systems or any other process, we are truly en route to what people talk about, to becoming a third world nation, a nation dependent on importing the necessary people with the necessary skills. So what's the role of community colleges? Community colleges are the last vestige of what I call the American dream. Access and affordability. You know, we apply standards, but everybody gets a shot through a community college. And to the degree we continue to make education affordable through community college is the degree to which we nurture the American dream, the degree to which we provide foundations for an American future. It's funny because that's almost exact. It's, it's very similar to what Pam said. She used, she replaced the word uh, American dream with democracy, I think. Mm -hmm. It's sort of the last, the last stand for... Un, I mean, class, race, immigration status, all of those things. It's like the open access model, which from from the sounds of what you're it's from from what you're saying, it sounds like that that model will stand. That the open access model, where you can come in, mm -hmm. put your cash or or financial financial aid dollars on the barrel head, and say, "I would like some knowledge, please," and someone is going to take those and say, "Here is some knowledge." Mm -hmm. That like that that's going to that's system, yeah, it's system going system. it is going to stay and it is going to stand. That you know that you do have the sort of the University of Phoenix thing, mm -hmm. sort of drawing away a lot of like that model, sort of drawing away a lot of a, a lot of pe or some people away, Americans certainly American students away. Um, but you do, I think that, I mean, the hybrid thing is, can you speak more to sort of the hybrid thing and sort of what, what, how, what do you, again, as somebody who's been on so many different levels of education over the past 30, 40 years, like what is, what does that look like actually? Well, I wish I knew, but when <laughs> I, when I talk about hybrid, I'm not talking about the classical hybrid class that is half online, half face to face. Mm -hmm. When I talk about hybrid, I'm going in the direction of one of those forces, well, both of those forces I talked about, shaping what we do, mm -hmm. the workplace wants people with competencies. They're less impressed with degrees. Uh, there was a wonderful old movie, the original Karate Kid movie, in which the, the young lad says to the Chinese, the ja Okinawan, actually, master, mm -hmm. Mr. Miyagi. Uh, Mr. Miyagi, do you have a black belt? And he said, sure. And he takes off the belt he has around his waist and says, J.C. Penny, $4.99, mm -hmm. emphasizing the point. It, it's not about the black belt. It's about the skills. Mm -hmm. And the workplace is saying to us, it's less about degrees and more about skills. So part of that hybrid is going to be our documenting competencies, competencies that can be achieved through different modalities, mm -hmm. part of which will be classroom instruction, some of which will be heavily content, some of it will be uh, workplace learning, internships, experiential, all of this coming together so that that graduate of the future may be certified in many different ways, may have a degree, but that degree will have different components than what a degree is today. Two questions. One, how has it been in terms of communicating with industry in general or employers in terms of extracting that kind of what do you need from us? And is there any danger in developing an educational system around I mean, I, I spend too much time teaching Karl Marx in my philosophy classes to not ask this question. Is there a danger? I knew his brother, uh, Groucho. <laughs> honk, honk. Wouldn't, wouldn't want him in any club that would have me as a member. So, <laughs> what, what is there sort of, yeah, so two parts. How is, how is that, how has that communication been from the industry side, in, in your opinion? And is there a danger in, in having industry drive, um, drive education? 
Well, let me point out, first of all, Marx was wrong about a lot of things uh, and right about many things. Is there a danger? Absolutely. Uh, industry is myoptic, at least as yes. practice in America. It's aware of its needs today, mm -hmm. not of its needs tomorrow. So if we focus totally on the minute, then we're not going to win. That's where this resiliency concept comes in, because that adaptive learner that we help to develop skills, particularly critical thinking skills at all levels, has to be prepared to move on. Industry will dump them. Tomorrow is a different technology, a different skill set, a different need. So yeah, there's a real danger in tailoring 100%. That's perhaps the reason why educators need crystal balls <laughs> uh, to be able to determine what's really going to happen. We've given this worker language. We've, we've said they need to be collaborative and adaptive and mm -hmm. critical thinking and reflective and so on and so forth. Using our sort of the five competencies that we've defined. What, what does an industry, what has the industry f sort of re given us, would you say, in your opinion, what, what kind of words have they given in terms of shaping or that, that, that will, again, shape this sort of educational model that's coming. What they've given us is an ulcer. <laughs> <laughs> what they've given us is a lack of definition. In educational circles, we all talk about industry wants advanced technology. But what is advanced technology? Because if you go to a range of employers, their concept of ad advanced technology is specific to a set of things they do and quite different than their neighbor down the block. Yeah, Nabisco doesn't have to know how to build the helicopters, right? Absolutely. So what is, you know, what is it? Uh, it's, it's difficult to answer that question. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to you. Do you let the, la the marketplace totally dictate what you do? And I think the answer is, is no. Um, again, it falls back to adaptive individuals and the skills necessary to be adaptive to continue to learn and change. Uh, I've had so many, I've been lucky to work in education mm -hmm. all of my life, but not in all the same positions. And it, that's required a lot of adaptation. Is, is there any like one or two things that you would sort of take away from your time and say, you know, if I could write a book on how to make an institution from scratch with, you know, magical wizardry, whoosh, Mm. These are sort of the two, one or two, or even three things that is really necessary. The registrar has to communicate with this uh, on a weekly, you know, like whatever, whatever you, whatever you're thinking. Like, what does it really take to build an institution from the ground up? In your opinion, and again, and I guess maybe have it be resilient in that sense. Well, I guess the first thing I would say is listen and learn. Educational institutions tend to be top-down institutions. Change happens at the top, flows to the bottom. It's not the best of all worlds to operate that way. Sometimes it's absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. But you, you need to be aware not only of the marketplace of ideas, of what other colleges are doing, you have to be able to determine the skill sets of your staff. You know, one management theory says you determine what's necessary and you get rid of people Good until job. you get the right people. Another management theory says you shape your environment according to the skill set of your employees. In colleges, we're, we more or less have to shape ourselves to the skill sets, particularly in community colleges where we can't compete financially and in hiring. So we take talented people who may lack experience, and very often we win that way. We get great people. Um, I, so I don't know any simple answer to that question, but it's part trial and error. You have to be willing to experiment. You have to be willing to take risks, and you can't punish risk takers which is different than somebody who's foolish. Mm -hmm. But if you punish risk-taking, if, if you want to innovate and you say, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to lose my job, it might irritate some board member. Mm -hmm. 
some administrator, you're not going to have change. The institution isn't going to be dynamic, which really goes to that talk about collaboration is real. A collaborative environment that draws collectively on the skills and talents of its staff is going to be the prosperous environment. And there's a question of creativity. You can command someone's body. You can command their work activities. What you can't command is their creativity. So we need environments where people are comfortable, that they don't live in fear with a great deal of anxiety, that you have motivational leadership, but that brings the best of people because the gift that any employee can give to a college is their respect of creativity creativity transforms environments. Does that creativity come from the dean level, do you think? Is in I it mean can. It, it can. Sure. It can come on any level. But you know when you get good people in a room and you put the idea on the table, uh, there can be tremendous synergy. Often in my career when wrestling with a difficult problem that I didn't necessarily have the answer to, I would talk to friends who were not in the industry, not in education, people who did not have the frame that I worked in. And most of the things that I would hear would not work. Mm -hmm. But then I would hear things that I never thought of and said, I say, damn, why? <laughs> that's great because I'm getting a different perspective. So you have to look into the field of ideas. You have an, um, an environment that ex examines ideas and is capable of turning some of those into realities, mm -hmm. a collaborative environment. Now, these are things easy to say and hard to do. I mean, as, as somebody who, again, also being faculty and also you know, spending time talking to faculty members about our competency model and about what we're trying to do, do you, th I mean, what is, what is from your perspective, how viable is this competency thinking with a faculty that may, I don't want to say, uh, again, it, it, so we, we were sort of chatted a little about the idea of change and, oh, did community colleges change, universities change even slower. But like, I mean, I mean, faculty, is, is it something that can be, you know, our, our faculty, can they do it? Are they okay with it? Absolutely. How hopeful are you? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I didn't feel like it was going to be something like that. Uh, true, Harry. <laughs> and well, no, that, that's the reality of uh, faculty. Mm -hmm. You can teach old dogs new tricks. Mm -hmm. You can have very mature senior faculty who will adopt new ideas and be excited by new approaches mm -hmm. and other faculty that you will not move with a bulldozer. Mm -hmm. So what you could, try to be very young too. I mean, could be could, young. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So you try to first form a coalition of the willing mm -hmm. and that's your basis. And then as the faculty change with an institution and you bring in new faculty regardless of age but you focus on on ideas faculty that will fit a new model i um, mean there's little question today that new faculty are far more technologically versed than a lot of the more mature faculty incorporate more technology into their classrooms not that technology is the be-all end-all but it's just reflective of what happens in a change process so you get an army of the willing, and you recruit an army of the willing, then you can uh, have change. Sounds like it's relationship-based, though. I mean, just getting that buy-in, getting that interest and support around something that we both know the values that are instilled in the resiliency competencies are skills that every institution would want their students to come out with, that that's not unique to a training program or a certificate program or, you know, a degree granting program. I think relationship building is everything. Relationship building is a strategy. It's an effective strategy. It has been for thousands of years. It still works. We all need to practice it as a strategy to be effective, to accomplish our goals. Could you, I mean, it was something, you know, before you came in, uh, it's something that Alex 
actually mentioned. It's like it's less about the job with Harry. It's more about the relationships. That's who you are. And at then your core. and that and like I be do you have um is are there strat I mean is there a strategy is there strategy to that? Yes. Your method. I yeah, mean, we, we we want yes. to tap into we want to tap into this well. <laughs> We're drilling. We're trying. What you, you like anything else, you can't get to a destination unless you know where you want to go. So you first figure out where you want to go. Mm-hmm. And then you look at the, the map and you see what's the shortest distance, which may not work because there's a lot of traffic. You know that. Mm-hmm. So in looking at that map, you try to figure out what's the most effective route to get to the destination. Are there going to be enough gas stations on that route? <laughs> Uh, you scope it, you figure out what it takes to get there. Then as part of that process, you realize the things you can do simply, the things you can't do simply. And there's where a strategy relationship building comes in. Who do I need to help me? And how do I get them to help me? And first of all, when you're asking for help, asking a stranger for help, It's not usually the best plan. There are many marvelous strangers who will help you. But it's much easier to get help when you're asking somebody that you know, that, quote, you have a relationship with. Mm -hmm. So understand the people you need to have relationships with. And you're not being disingenuine, Mm -hmm. you know, but it is an effective strategy to lead you to find that right path to the destination that you want to go to. So you're right for me, a relationship is very important, but it's important other than the personal end, it's important within the context of achieving a goal. Mm-hmm. It's it's inseparable from achieving the goal. It's just one of many strategies that can be used. Don't don't make people your enemies. I if, like yeah, yeah. I'd I'd like to relate that directly to the PLA idea. Because a lot of what you're describing is, at least in my mind, ringing the bell for me in terms of what the spirit, the spirit of PLA is, I mean, I may not really understand the logistical side as much as I probably should. We have the director of PLA here tonight. So Amen. So, um, the, the, but the spirit of it is very much in that same way where like, in essence, by making demands upon a student on what they lack and what they need to pay for in order to come up to, you know, come up to the level that we have established as a school. Like, you come in, you lack this, this, and this, and these are the things you're going to have to do before I can even let you in the door. That instead of, flip that around and say, instead of having that person be someone of having a lack of things, that that person now comes in with experience that can be even quantified Mm-hmm. You know, according to either some sort of test to, te- you know, like even some sort of kind of testing experience that you can actually accept people, not even just as customers, but almost as resources and saying that you have had work experience or life experience, something that you've, you've had beyond our doors that we want you to come in and we are going to give you quote unquote credit, sometimes mm-hmm. literally credit for what you've done. Yeah. That to me is very much about the relationship building that I think you were that you were describing maybe even more so just to kind of get something like PLA done. It just to me the the parallel that they seem to run and kind of run in tandem. The, the relationship building again in with PLA is the strategy to get you to where you you want to go. But when you distill PLA, what is it? It's it's just about student success. When you look for a common denominator to most educators, unfortunately, not all. And particular in the community college, it's a commitment to student success. So this is PLA is a tool in the toolkit of student success. Not an easy one because it's not traditional and we resist things that are not traditional. You know, when the economy went sour the, the, with the Great Recession, I had a student in class. This fellow was a man in his 40s who had, after graduation, high school graduation, to went to work for a, a small company that grew into a corporation. He learned his accounting skills on the job. He was the chief accountant for this firm, 
and the firm fell on hard times after the recession and closed. He's out of a job. He can't find a job. He can't find an accounting job because he doesn't have an accounting degree. He's in my class. He could have taught most of our accounting courses and probably better than some of the faculty that were teaching them. How very sad and, and wasteful that we push him through that path when he's already had the competencies, exceeded the competencies that we were going to award with the degree. That's common sense for anybody. That's the common sense of PLA. But it's the realization that we're here. Let me back this up. One of the differences, I think, between baccalaureate and community colleges, and without being disrespectful to baccalaureate institutions. There's none of those in the room, so you can buy all means. <laughs> <laughs> Very often, the community college, the baccalaureate institution is focused on content. Mm. degrees, yes. the content that equals the degree. And I'm not dismissing content. No, no, no. I don't want a physician who hasn't learned any content <laughs> in, in his or her <laughs> educational career. But community colleges have a very different view. We look at, as a goal, student success. Mm -hmm. Success in the classroom, success in life, success post the classroom. And so that is one of our common denominators for community colleges. Well, uh, faculty, I mean, you mentioned the sort of student success is sort of the, it's, it's the co content on, on the four-year side and then the, then the student success yes. on the second and the two-year side. Is there, I want, I know that there is a huge benefit to this, but it's also can be a bit of a, a, a drawback, I think, in terms of changing and establishing competencies and stuff like that, that there are, because you mentioned the accountant who could teach these classes. Yes. Not being a trained teacher, mm -hmm. that's a lot that, you know, four-year schools have people teaching that are scholars. They're really great researchers for the most part. And a lot of them, frankly, tolerate the teaching in order to be able to do the research that they want to do. Yes. At the second year school, a lot of folks are working folks. Industry. They actually, they're, they're, they're actually the people out in the industry mm -hmm. and they're not as many. I mean, there certainly are trained teachers that do community college work. Uh, a lot of them are wonderful, but there are there is especially when we're talking about the kinds of things that, for instance, the NRC, our NRC instructors, a lot of them they bring that in are folks that are EMTs. They are actual community health workers of some degree. You know, like they are the ones that are actually doing the jobs, but they aren't trained in teaching. Is there room in the next decade to make turn those industry folks into trained teachers? Or is it incumbent upon us to find trained teachers that do have to find that magical mix mm. of someone who is trained in teaching, thus able to train resilient students in an industry setting, in an industry? Like, again, yeah. all the parts is that I mean, can we mix that cocktail? I mean, what do you what do you do see? We need to. Yeah. What is where, where is that? Where do you, where do you kind of stand on that? that kind well, of thinking? If I could answer all these questions, I'll be getting a call from Harvard this afternoon. <laughs> That's work. Uh, Harvard Education. We're working on yeah, it, Harry. Uh, looking uh, to give me a job. Uh, <laughs> why do we always have to have trained teachers? Well, is, what, uh, can I be devil's advocate and say that that is the job you're hiring them for, are you not? No, we're hiring them. The job we're hiring them for is to facilitate student learning. Which is okay. Now we're in an interesting area. So you would differentiate that from teaching how? That's interesting. Well, I'm just saying that saying everybody has to be a trained teacher is a box that's mm -hmm. with unnecessary constraint. In some cases, being a trained teacher is is fabulous. Mm -hmm. What I like to see in the classroom are people who excite, mm -hmm. people who motivate. Okay coupled with the requisite content and objectives of whatever it is. Uh, one of the best teachers I had as an undergraduate wasn't a trained teacher. He was a psychologist who worked for NASPA, NASA rather, and um, brought his industry skills into the classroom. He was fantastic. And oddly enough, I didn't know he was fantastic. We took a first semester course, Psych 101, mm -hmm. and thought this course was so easy. <laughs> it was so easy that there was no value to it. 
Then I take Psych 102 with a trained faculty member and realized everybody who was in the class I was in was light years ahead. And that we had learned without realizing we were learning. <laughs> How ideal is that? <laughs> uh, but not a trained teacher. So I think it's a big tent. And yes, you want trained teachers, trained, motivated teachers. But you have to be open to various other people that are going to be very effective in the learning process who may not be trained teachers. I mean, it's just that we're talking about students. What made me think of this is the fact that we were talking about students and their, you know, you, again, you mentioned the accountant who didn't have the accounting degree, who was an excellent accountant and who was actually could have been an excellent teacher. Mm -hmm. You know, that that teachers are maybe are too unfairly um, the idea of going to get certified to be a teacher, for instance, or to take uh, get an ME, MED or an EDD or something like that, that some sort of pedagogical training is necessary for you to do the particular job. And I mean, I would agree with you that there is the that teacher is someone who can help students learn on their own, that the sort of idea of student success, that mm -hmm. the motivation and the there should be some intrinsic opening up of some mm -hmm. intrinsic desire to actually know mm -hmm. how to or again, if we're talking about content, a what. You know, yeah. and that, that, that isn't particular to somebody uh, who has been trained. You know, most university faculty have never been trained in any aspect of education. They're just content experts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's much to be said of value in teacher training. Mm -hmm. uh, there are skill sets associated with that that can be taught. It, it's good to have a frame that gives you a context to the history of the profession, mm -hmm. uh, to understand things that have been tried, didn't work, things that may work. So there, there's value to teacher education. Sure. But the real value, the largest value for teacher education at the second, you know, mm -hmm. for secondary elementary is in the practicum, in the student teaching, where people get to experience the classroom <laughs> before they're in a full-time job. Job. And any number of student teachers that I've known over the years decided they were no longer going to be a teacher after their student teaching experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a great aspect of, of teacher training. Also, in my experience of hiring adjuncts, very often an adjunct who's never taught before in their first semester, many of them have a disastrous semester. Mm -hmm. There's so much they need to learn about classroom management, but you can help them learn that. Mm -hmm. So once again, there's just no right formula here. Mm -hmm. um, of course not, yeah. You know, you assess and you be practical. But you keep the eye on the ball, which is the welfare of the student and sure. student learning. I know that we've talked a lot before about um, the education and experiences that students come to the community college with, their idea of what they want to pursue in terms of a profession and maybe the role that student support services end up having on cha in changing that path or influencing that path. It made me, um, I connected that to what you're talking about with the student teaching, where mm -hmm. you go into this classroom, you have this experience, it's you know the application of your skills in a real life setting. Coming out of that, you say, I don't really know that this is the right fit for me. Mm -hmm. And I know that that really closely aligns to what student support services does yeah. in terms of student success and that role of having some kind of support throughout your development in a college. And I mean, this this kind of connects to intrusive advising, too. And I, I know that that's something that you feel very strongly about. I, I, I do. I, I don't think we put enough emphasis on the intake process in colleges. Uh, we The intake process tends to be somewhat bureaucratic. You know, you need to fill out this form, you need to go see the registrar, you need to go take this test, all of which is necessary. I mean, that's real. Mm -hmm. But I think more time needs to be spent speaking with the student about exploring what is it you want? <laughs> What are your dreams? Are, are you here because mom and dad said you were here? Or, mm -hmm. I dropped are, off the front door, yeah. Are you in this major just because you were better in high school chemistry than anything else, so you think you want to be a chemist? Explore with them the practicality of what they're doing. Explore their dreams. Use effective career software that sometimes will be reflective to help them express what they're really believing that they can't verbalize. Mm -hmm. Do all of that 
up front and then help them construct a major or a program or a direction, even if sometimes that means saying to them, this is the wrong place for you to be. Is that what you would consider intrusive when, we, when, we, when no. people talk about intrusive? Uh, no, I, I, I don't think that's – well, you could argue it's intrusive. I don't think – Well, the, not as the, a pejorative, but as a style. Yeah, I don't think <laughs> at the – sounds foundational, though. Yeah, yeah see, providing. at the front end of the process, I don't think it's terribly intrusive. Mm -hmm. When we go on – because at that point we're being – this is a proactive yeah, activity. From the start. Mm. Okay, yeah, Much of what we do is reactive. Mm. So we see that a student's not attending class, the, right. the midterm roster, they're failing. Yeah. We become reactive and we send them a notice. But really being intrusive or invasive is not accepting sending them a notice. It's getting them in front of you mm -hmm. and saying, we need to talk about this mm. and, and really probing really probing, kind of violating space a little bit to try <laughs> to get at the, the core of the issue. But I don't think it's terribly intrusive up front to deal with those things. I have found students are warmly responsive to that dialogue. Any number of students that I have advised as a faculty member that were new to my advising, after an advising session, changed a major. Mm -hmm. Because I would talk about what they want, and then I'd look at their major, look at their courses, and said. I'm doing? fine with what you want. This just isn't going to get you to where you want to go. Right. So yeah. I think that's a very upfront. But through the process, we don't think if somebody's had a car accident, they've hurt their leg, we don't think it's strange that they use a crutch to get around uh, or if they need a motorized wheelchair. We understand that all things are not equal and some things require support. Mm -hmm. Why do we fail to understand what we accept in the physiological realm mm -hmm. within the educational realm? Some people need more support mm -hmm. than other people. Providing a network of support is a very effective tool on the road to student success of various, various supports. We know at this particular time and place that we have a hard time recruiting STEM majors. America needs them. Mm -hmm. We know that the students that do go into STEM largely drop out. So unless you're blind, deaf, and dumb, you realize <laughs> you need a nurturing program for STEM students, mm -hmm. which in fact sports make the difference between right. success and failure. As opposed to just saying, today we're going to teach critical thinking. Yeah. Not going to work. When I when I taught an orientation course, a freshman seminar, and the students really hate it, what I'm about to tell you is, you know my fondness for mysteries. Well, I would give them a mystery problem. I would give them a murder or a crime and say, your essay is to solve it. And you have great liberty, but you can't break the laws of science or physics. You have to come up. They really hated doing it, but they had to think. They had to think. And then when we discussed it, it could be very provocative. But you need to find ways, as I said, to embed, contextualize these competencies as, as part of a necessary part of education. And that's, I mean, that's what I was thinking about in terms of, I mean, in playing devil's advocate in terms of like, do teachers need to be trained as teachers? Mm -hmm. Because that kind of... It's quite a leap, I think, or not quite a leap, it is a leap to tell a teacher to say, all right, I want you to give them something which may not have an answer. Mm -hmm. I want you to test them on that obstacle. Mm -hmm. And I want you to be able to feel confident that you can evaluate that performance and give them a grade, even if they have failed at something. Mm -hmm. That like that's something that can be very hard. I think for just just sort of saying it out loud, it sounds like yeah. well, that's a, that seems like a very strange and almost counter almost mm -hmm. counterintuitive thing. But really, what we are talking about is embracing the idea that just like you're saying with like you don't punish risk, risk takers, right? You're not if somebody doesn't solve the crime, let's say, mm -hmm. like well, they, they didn't can, fail. Yeah, right. they didn't fail. They didn't fact, fail. You can, get, you can get a very high score on that assignment by having done the assignment in the me employing the did. method that you were supposed to do. That like, I don't know. Like that. That's the exciting. But on the on the, that's the exciting challenge for I think the NRC is 
speaking, continuing, starting maybe, sure. or joining the conversation to say, you can evaluate as an instructor and student, you can learn mm -hmm. by this model of education that you are not going to be asked to get something right. And that if you don't get it right, you're going to fail. In mm -hmm. fact, failure is what we're going to evaluate and create a culture that embraces failure. It also reminds me of what um, some of the faculty said at Bunker Hill about when they give an assignment and there's not really step-by-step -step instructions on there's how to none. do it. Sometimes there's none. <laughs> and they and students' Hate first that. reaction is to yeah. ask the instructor, yeah. "What do I do? Where do well, I where start? Where do I start? It's like how do I approach yeah, this?" Yeah. And a lot. And what's not neat again? Those are IT faculty where it's like they play the role of boss and client so well in that sense. But they also really ask their students to trust the fact that like you're in this room because you love computers yeah. on some level mm -hmm. right you get them they're part of your they're kind of part of who you are they're under your fingers they're in your hands so to mm -hmm. speak that tr you need to actually go ahead and trust yourself that yep. kind of thing and Embracing sort of that. And, and again creating a classroom like that can be scary for trained teachers mm -hmm. and it can be scary for people who are not mm -hmm. trained teachers there's a lot we're, we're putting a lot of faith in the right people certainly mm -hmm. but the community college teachers being those people to kind of take up that particular banner those agents yeah that exactly that kind of i think for they those. do i understand a lot about failure because i've <laughs> done it failed so often this in my CV own life says so many. <laughs> we saw it right here so i understand about failure and i agree with you you don't punish failure but is failing what we call failure is is it failure uh, i gave an essay assignment two weeks ago in fact i'll collect it in class tomorrow night and for the students to write an essay and i gave them the topic but i said understand i don't want you to give me Google, you know, I don't want you just to copy Wikipedia. I don't want citations. This is not a research paper. So what I want you to do on this topic is to tell me what you learned by reading about this topic. You don't have to cite it. You don't have to be original. It doesn't have to be PhD quality. It has to be about you and what your takeaway was from mm -hmm. this assignment. There is no failing that. Right. The only way you fail it is not to do it, to be irresponsible, and then you fail mm -hmm. because you've made a decision. But the task isn't going to lead you to any failure. Mm -hmm. But again, when you get back to teacher training, so much is, is based on trial and error and experiential. Much that you can teach teachers, much that you can't teach teachers, uh, I just don't see any simple answer to that other than what you said is get the right people in the classroom. I just, I really want to make sure that we spend some time talking a little bit more about, you know, why student support services are going to continue to matter so much as we look at um, the students that we're serving. And I know you could probably speak to this, um, looking at it from changes in times with how students once were, how they are today. Today's students, you've you've um, said in the past, they need more support, especially mm -hmm. this generation of yeah. students. And so, I guess I just I'm interested to hear what kind of case you know you think um, we should be able to make on on any level for student support services in recognizing passion, but also getting training to align with a career. All of those, you know huge things. We have that responsibility and I think it kind of yep. factors under student support services. Outside of outside of the pure, pure wonderful satisfaction of helping somebody, mm -hmm. which is a great part of student support. I, I've always said I've got the greatest job in the world in many of the capacities that I've had is because I get paid to come to work to help people. And, you know, and invariably, sometime I would help somebody and they'd say, thank you. And I'd say, I don't need a thank you. I love what I'm doing here. Uh, that's a wonderful part. But student, student support services are under the economic gun. They're more likely to be cut than anything else because they're not seen as associated with the instructional, the core mission. The argument 
outside of, again, the commitment to the humanity, uh, the argument to be made is a question of retention. Uh, very few institutions right now in the community college are enrollment rich. We're going through a period because of local, state, federal defunding of education, increasing prices, fewer students being able to engage in this process. Retaining your student body is everything. There is no question that a network of student supports will boost retention, and uh, we have to do a better job of documenting that. Yeah. I mean, because in administrative speak, to chief financial officers who often hear the cha-ching, cha-ching, uh, this is translated into the language that they understand, tuition and fees. Um, so that's the practical end of it. But what is retention? It all goes back, <clears throat> again, to student success. Retention is student success. But get people where they want to go. A problem I dealt with today in discussion with someone is a student who's acting out in the classroom. They're throwing books, and the faculty member doesn't want them in the classroom. Uh, as the student was spoken with, Suppose student doesn't want to be here. They're here because their mother makes them be here mm -hmm. and they're acting out and people are trying to get the student on the right path. Mm -hmm. The advice that I, consultative advice that I gave is stop trying to get the student on that path. Mm -hmm. Talk to the student and understand he doesn't want to be here. Help him develop an exit strategy mm -hmm. from the college, an exit strategy that doesn't leave him with a black mark on his record, that leaves the door open, that doesn't another, lock him out. Yeah. Huh, another doesn't point lock him. in time he can return here somewhere else and be successful. That's the type of, it doesn't necessarily help the institution today, but you helped a person, it's going to help some other institution tomorrow. But understanding where the student wants to go, and, and helping that path, which is sometimes to a degree. When I worked at a very expensive private university, I would sometimes counsel students to go to a less expensive state college because they were getting in, in debt that they couldn't afford, mm -hmm. and there was an alternate route. So again, about understanding their needs, and it's part of the complex picture of student supports yeah. about what's best for the student, which is usually best for the institution. Not always. And then I could argue when you have that type of goodwill, it's better than any PR you could get. Yeah. And that it builds enrollment as the people you help talk to you. They talk to other folks and it brings students in. No easy answers. Let's close out with um, if you could, I mean, again, this is very much in the spirit of what you were just talking about. Can you close out by explaining as briefly as you can, sort of the logistics of prior learning assessment. You are a student, why, and 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 you are at institution X, community college, blah. There is a perfect, you know, Shangri La version of prior learning assessment established at community college X. As a student, walk through that prior learning assessment. Uh, process, if you could, <laughs> as again, as, 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 you know, it's, I, I, th I think a lot, I'd, I'd love to get on record sort of the logistics of what a prior learning assessment, uh, when it's established at an institution properly, what that looks like for, from the student well, side. We're, we're looking at the base of the rainbow where the pot of gold yeah. is. Exactly. Or, uh, in, in the spirit of the month of March. I, I, <laughs> we're kissing Blarney stones, but let's do it. <laughs> yeah. There's going to be a lot of Blarney stone here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, you, you, first of all, students have to be aware that there's a potential of, in the, the currency of higher education is credits. Mm -hmm. There's a potential of currency based on things they may have done or may have learned. This is really a hard sell for, for uh, undergraduates. How do you make that sell? How do you reach them? You, through a you, website or, I mean, through shaking out in their shaking hands in high schools or well, what? The uh, more ways you can do it, probably the better is with anything else. But this goes back to that intake process I talked about, the comprehensive intake, where is the person doing the intake as they speak to that student and they, they ascertain a lot of things and they may see potential. Mm -hmm. um, 
So up front, make the customer, the student, aware of this potential. But right now we're at Is that a, an advisor? Is it is that Oh, I think in, very in much. Is it yeah, I think it's role? I think that's where it should start. Yeah, absolutely. At admission. So an admissions Ab- advisor front door right. that's that. Okay. But every faculty member mm-hmm. should also every faculty member and the type of explorations you have with your students be prepared to bring this message to students, I have a student this semester, very similar to the uh, accounting person, who uh, she graduated high school, went to work for a law firm, and was doing administrative assistant type work, uh, married, had children, now a husband has since disappeared, returning to the workforce. She can't get a job because she doesn't have a credential. You know, and I've talked to her, this is at a different institution than we're at. But I talked to her about pursuing some assessment of her work experience to see what there we might translate into credit. Okay, And so that's the way the faculty being proactive and invasive or intrusive mm-hmm. can try to, to help students okay. with this. So front end with faculty, with administrators, but the area is still very limit it because we're working on the basis of content exchanges generally. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we use challenge tests, Mm -hmm. challenge exams, you know, and administered uh, before they even matriculate after they matriculate. Where does that, where does that kind of happen? Well, institutions don't like to do that before them before depends on how you define matriculation. Well, in a community (laughs) college matriculation, just usually registering. Right. Uh, Institutions financially don't like to do that before the student is, in fact, a student. Mm-hmm. And but there are other institutions such as Thomas Edison mm-hmm. and other sta- CLEP and other standardized tests a student can take before entrance into an institution that will have portable credentials that they can move around. But mm-hmm. this is mostly based on content equivalencies. When you do a challenge exam, the faculty mm-hmm. member determines, they look at their course outline, the things a student, the, the objectives that they have and they, mm-hmm. the content associated when they test that. Portfolio review that right now we at this institution are relying on Thomas Edison to do takes a broader view of experiences that someone may have had and translating them into credits. So Thomas but Edison I still would... think the focus in the future needs to be more on less on credit content exchange and more on understanding competencies but that that collection of a portfolio let's say like is that that is something thomas says and would essentially interview that student and say okay here, we're going to put together basically a jacket of you you know again this portfolio this document that has several pieces to it you have been evaluated by thomas someone by thomas edison who's trained to do this. the the thomas edison approach which is a fairly standardized approach is in fact the student has to take a course, a portfolio course. Oh. So they take the one course learning how to construct their portfolio. That oh. would be portfolio one. Mm-hmm. And then portfolio two is actually building that portfolio and subjecting it for submitting it for review. So that's a whole year, that's two semesters. It's shorter than that. It the time the the time frame to do that is shorter than two semesters, but it's um, an elaborate process. Mm-hmm. Yes. Now, some institutions will do that in-house. It would be part of that new future would be to develop more in-house faculty capable, trained in doing portfolio review. And that then that portfolio is evaluated. Let's again, let's say it is still as it is a separate institution. Portfolio one, portfolio two, that document is then created. And then that student then bring it brings that to community college X yeah. and then that that community college has 
basically are they on their own in terms of evaluating that portfolio is there does an entire community college system need to agree on how to interpret them to interpret those documents in terms of this kind of experience will always get three credits in this this kind of experience will always get three credits in this like how does how does that how do you envision that working Perfectly. An entire community college community never agrees on anything. Exactly. Uh, Which is what I was thinking. So I was wondering what you were thinking in terms of your to, Shangri-La version of this. But to put this in the current practical context, if we do an, in a portfolio review in-house, mm -hmm. it's fine. And we apply that to the degree. The student decides to transfer to another institution that is probably not a portable credential just like a challenge exam is probably not a portable credential. When we a student goes to an external degree granting institution, such as Empire State College or Thomas Edison, mm -hmm. and they do portfolio review, they transcript that. The student will now have a Thomas Edison or an Empire State or other institution transcript. That becomes a portable credential, and most likely all the colleges within a particular area of middle states or other accreditation area are going to honor that transcript and accept it. Mm -hmm. So in advising students, portability is an issue. Mm -hmm. CLEP exams tend to be portable, mm -hmm. you know, whereas an internal, you know, challenge exam is not. Various institutions will determine different CLEP scores that they'll accept, what they give for it. So that's the answer, whether we're talking about Shangri-La or what's in the current marketplace. But there's a practicality. You have to look to what the student can do with a, creden a credential that's given them. How valuable is it here? Mm -hmm. How valuable is it beyond here? I mean, can you imagine someone like your accountant getting a great deal of college credits on his transcript for his work experience. Abs as, absolutely. Like, I mean, we're talking about double digits. Yeah. Really? Well, for all the, all of the business, for the, all of the accounting courses associated with the major, for many of the business courses associated with the major, mm -hmm. not for the one we're doing equivalencies, not for the gen ed, mm -hmm. um, but maybe some of, the gen ed, if in fact in preparing that portfolio review, we can see samples of writing mm -hmm. and composition that are first class, well, then we better be talking about getting rid of English 101 and 102. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think a lot. Okay. I mean, yeah, that's that sounds incredibly ideal. <laughs> and, it is. And, and, and I think, and I think, you know, I think maybe. I mean, I don't know how in depth we want to go into this, but like the idea that that like by saying that someone doesn't have to buy the product, I can't imagine a school or at least a more conservative school being like, why would I sign up for that? Uh, Pollyanna died on the way over here today. <laughs> I've been playing that character all interview. So <laughs> there, uh, there has to be a viable business model mm -hmm. or else it's not going to succeed. So that business model means there are fees associated with this process that make it acceptable to an institution. But the fee structure is effective for the student because they're going to be paying less than they would be paying for those credit credits. Something gained, something lost, not Pollyanna, effective business model. In the last four years, there's been a great deal of talk about the free online universities, um, most of which are not succeeding simply because there's not an effective business model for it. It's, it's As long as there's a Gates or somebody willing to fund them, they'll succeed. Mm -hmm. But funding by the rich is not a successful business model. So, I mean, that's just the workplace reality. We've taken up a lot of your time, Harry. This has been absolutely delightful. It's exactly what it's exactly what I wanted. Again, you've been such an incredible, you know, monolith. It's you a know, good word for him. Plinth. Words that end in T H N T H <laughs> um, for, you know, you know, you're very much the, at the heart of this this project. And I think it's a 
you know, I've, I've had a great, you know, it's been a great pleasure getting to know you. Like, you're going away or something. Right. Yeah, I... It's like getting, getting to know you, like... <laughs> Do you know something <laughs> I don't know? <laughs> <laughs> um, here's your pink slip. No. Um, yeah, no, it's been, it's been wonderful. And it's been great. And again, you know, you know, more... The ins and outs. <laughs> you know more about this than I could ever possibly dream of understanding again. You know, so... Thank you so much for giving us a, a, a quick little snapshot of what you got for you know what you've raised in this. Thank you as well. If you'd like to hear more about the Northeast Resiliency Consortium. You can stay exactly where you are. There are podcasts here on our SoundCloud page that definitely go, uh, I think, quite a long way to telling our story. Uh, You can go to skillscommons.org and type in the Northeast Resiliency Consortium into the search box and find an ever-growing cavalcade of documents, which are also telling our story in written form as opposed to the audio form here on SoundCloud. And then there is our monthly newsletter, which you can subscribe to by going to www.northeastresiliency.org. There's no consortium in that web address. So for Alex, I'm at Fiennes. We will see you here really soon for more Resiliency Roundtables from the NRC.